Hi, good evening and welcome to this CPDME webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Umrod and I will be facilitating tonight's webinar and I will very shortly be handing you over to Jake Turner, talking physiology of shock in trauma. So um, for those who are pretty new to webinars, I've got some guides here for you. So what you've got at the bottom of your screen is you've got a chat box and you have got a question and answer box. And Andrea, you have just beat me to it. So good evening, Andrea. Uh, she's popped in the chat. Uh, Spencer, evening, everybody. Um, so please do interact with us in the chat. Tell us maybe where you're dialing in from tonight. Good evening, Carmen from North London. Maybe dial, tell us where you're dialing in from. Uh, maybe tell us what you do for a living. Uh, also tell us how you found us tonight where did you find us did you go to the website did, was it on social media was it via the app so it's always useful to know because the marketing team love that kind of thing don't they and that gets them quite excited in the morning but don't tell them i said that to you so if you have any questions for jake then please use the question and answer box uh, because then we can filter them out and make sure that we keep all of this webinar tonight into a reasonable time frame uh, lots of people in the chat now in fact it's moving that quickly uh, i can't see it jill third year from uclan good university that jill but i'm a bit biased because i did go there uh, david uh, from ireland um claire who's a third year student permanent from coventry evening claire great to have you on board please make sure you take some notes tonight i have no doubts there will be an assignment somewhere talking physiology of trauma in your oscars maybe certainly for your second or third year um gosh there is lots of people now i can't keep up with that chat maybe you can keep up with that chat jake but i certainly can't so um premium members who are cpd me will get your certificate within 24 hours and i'm going to give you a little demo in a second and show you how that works and of course you get access to all of the recordings afterwards so we are live on youtube tonight because we've got over a thousand people registered but uh, you will get access to the recordings if you're a member it is also uh, equally good if you are on social media so make sure that you give us a follow uh what's also good is if you are on social media maybe take us a selfie uh, so if you're sat there in your terry toweling um robe or you're sat there uh with a, a cup of peppermint tea hugging your dog drop us a message on social media copy us in at cpdme with the hashtag cpd made simple and uh, if we give you a like and a thumbs up we will send you one of our complimentary cpdb cups uh, we've only got ten thousand of them left and the good thing about these amazing cups is when you scan the qr code on the front it goes through to all of our webinars so it's almost like a, a cup that keeps on giving so here's some great reasons why to join cpd me number one if you struggle like me to record your cpd i promise it makes it super simple so it takes away the time the thought process the formatting and what do i do with all of this evidence and i'm going to show you in a second in this quick video that i'm going to let you watch but it allows you to capture your cpd it allows you to backdate it forward date it and more importantly if you are lucky enough to be chosen for audit it takes two clicks of a mouse and you are HCPC, NMC, GMC, ABCD, EFG ready with the support of an amazing team behind me who will make sure that they fully support you. Uh, Branka from Austria. Good evening, Branka. Uh, and Shell, from, uh, who's a nurse. Good evening from South Wales. Um, we've got Amar from Bosnia. Uh, evening, Amar. Uh, Pam, can you see me? Absolutely not, Pam. So, <laughs> I'm guessing you might have a Terry Terrell in dressing gown on, but we definitely can't see you, so please don't worry about covering your camera up. And, of course, we've got Amanda. Good evening, Amanda. Um, that's a face and a name I recognise. So, CPD certificates only come out to members, and they come out normally within 24 hours. And the amazing thing what happens that is unique to CPD Me is when our certificates come to you by email, they also automatically go into our CPDME app and they create you a CPD entry. So after tonight's webinar, within 11 o'clock in the morning, when you open our app, like you can see on screen, when you go into entries, you will be able to see at the top, Jake's physiology, physiology of shock and trauma. When you open that up, the system will have already created you the title, the date, and the fact that it's a video lecture, then all you need to do is you can see the certificate there is go in and very quickly reflect and edit that entry and tell people what have you learned, how is it going to influence the change of practice, and how long did it take. So you, you choose your governing body, it then specifically formats your CPD just for your governing body. And here's where the magic happens when you click the dictate button at the very bottom, you tell the app what have you learned, 
How is it going to change your practice and how will it support you within your professional remit? And then it creates the most perfectly formatted CPD entry. So whether you are a doctor, a nurse or a paramedic, I promise this will make recording CPD easier than you could ever imagine. Uh, Becky from, um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that name, but I'll go for New Zealand, a uh, social worker in mental health. Um, fabulous. Great to have you on board. I did say to Jake, we have a pretty international audience, uh, but we've equally um, got Tim from Cornwall. So we've ticked lots of boxes. So that app, once you've ticked the HCPC standards or whatever standards relate to your governing body, you can then see there that the certificate has already been uploaded by the system, which makes it even easier and more magical. Click on it for a preview and then you can click on save and submit and that is it recording your cpd quicker than you can brush your teeth quoted by an occupational therapist recently and then when you click on to preview you can see that was the first one and then when you click on preview you can see it's formatted it perfectly for you and then of course is your supporting evidence or so it really does make recording cpd simple and best of all the app is completely free of charge to download from the app store so just search cpd on the app store uh, always good to get some feedback from you. So I will be posting a feedback mm -hmm. for Jake's presentation tonight because we then give that to Jake and he can use that for his own CPD. But more importantly, it allows Caroline and the team here to make sure that we are bringing the right webinars for you, but equally are providing the right content that will support your practice. So if you do use CPDME or you've used us or you've used our webinars and you really enjoy them, please do leave us some genuine feedback. And tomorrow, Fabio and the team will issue two £25 Amazon vouchers so you can buy yourself a book on physiology of trauma, maybe, or maybe buy yourself something exciting from Amazon like I don't know, some CPDME mugs or a CPDME folder, but please do leave us some genuine feedback. I will post some links shortly, but that leads us to tonight's presentation. So if you are sitting comfortable, I'm going to hand over to Jake. Are you there, Jake? Yeah, good to go. Let me just uh, start sharing the screen. Perfect. Brilliant. Have a look in. Excellent. Okay, so uh, good evening. Um, it's fantastic to see so many uh, people in the audience and international as well, which is uh, wonderful to see. Uh, my name is uh, Jake Turner. I'm an anaesthetic and pre-hospital motor medicine consultant in the Midlands. I work across both the East and West Midlands, but my hospital practice is as an anaesthetist in Nottingham. Caroline has asked me to talk to you today about the physiology of trauma, shock and bleeding mimics. It's a talk she's seen me give a few times before, um, and it's an area that I'm I'm particularly interested in. So there's some updates in here for anybody that's seen this talk before. So hopefully some new bits to go over. The content of today's talk is we're obviously going to talk about the physiology of hemorrhage, but I also want to spend a bit of time thinking about um, arterial injury shock or the, the physiology that you see when you have a, a big hole in a decent sized artery, because it's kind of a relatively new concept and something which certainly is relevant to our pre-hospital practice. Um, you can't do a talk on this topic without kind of touching exsanguination and um, the hate for late, uh, which I'm sure is a term that's familiar to many of you in the audience. We're going to go over some bleeding mimics, and I want to really focus in on brain injury and that neurocardiac axis and how we can differentiate between a patient who has that or somebody who has hypervolemic cardiovascular collapse. And part of that understanding, I think, lies with CO2 or end tidal CO2, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that later. And then finally, the last two slides, um, and this is a new addition to this, is looking at resuscitation targets. I've added this because I get asked this a lot, what should we resuscitate patients to? And there isn't a single answer. Um, and there's a talk in its own right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna summarize that hopefully quite nicely at the end, but the, the take home is that it has to be patient specific. And I'll give you a few tricks in that regard. Okay, so let's go back to the base evidence for all of this. This was the paper that when I first read it kind of got me interested in this topic, um, published in 1995. So it's a bit of an oldie. Um, and actually, a lot of the evidence that it talks about um, is based on uh, research that was done back in the 80s. So this is old information, but it was certainly something that kind of changed my practice when I read it. Now, the first two things it kind of highlights in this paper is that shock or hypervolemic shock is not always accompanied by that classical tachycardia and hypotension. And that's frustrating because that's what we're taught 
you know, we go through medical school, paramedical school, whatever your base specialty is, that is the marker of hypovolemia that we're, we're led to believe. And actually, if you look at all the historic evidence, um, only a minority of the patients who have hypervolemic shock present with that classical finding. You get a third of patients become hypotensive and tacky. Um, and actually, a lot of patients, particularly young ones, can be bradycardic. And even the ones who do mount a relative tachycardia never really gets that high. So this is really tricky. So how do we go about recognizing these patients? And that's why I think it's important to understand the physiology behind this. So you can start to pick out where those nuances are. And this is a brilliant bit of research that is, that's kind of presented in this paper. Um, it's well worth having a look at. These are healthy volunteers that have been venesected down to the point of losing consciousness. I'm not convinced we'd get the ethics to do this um, this day and age, but it definitely gave us some really useful physiological data. So just to orientate yourself, you've got a load of physiological variables in the y-axis and time of exsanguination model or hypervolemia on the x-axis. And you can see that you do start to get an uptick in your peripheral vascular resistance. Your heart rate starts to increase and you maintain a relatively static blood pressure. So that's pretty classical. That's what we've been led to believe happens in these patients. But in a number of them, there is a physiological tipping point where there's a depressor, an autonomically driven depressor reflex where you vasodilate, you become bradycardic and not unsurprisingly, your blood pressure and your cardiac output bottom out. And on face value, it looks a bit odd. It's like, why does the human physiological response to profound hypervolemia do this? Because surely this must be a bad thing. But what's really fascinating is that in the animal models, if you try and reverse this tipping point, give them vasoconstrictors, give them something to speed the heart rate up, they do worse. So this is probably protective, maybe of coronary perfusion, but we're not entirely sure. So let's talk a little bit more about this biphasic heart rate response, because this is what catches us out and myself out on the number of occasions with bleeding patients. So what we mean by biphasic response is where you get a tachycardia or relative tachycardia followed by a bradycardic, in, a bradycardic episode. And it seems to be predominantly in patients who are presenting with hypervolemia as a consequence of penetrating trauma. OK, so that incisional trauma, knife, knife injuries, you tend to see this. And there's something about blunt injuries or blunt trauma, the, the pain of it, the ischemia of it, the polytraumatic nature of that blunt polytrauma that protects patients from this biphasic response. OK, so let's have a little look at some of the base reflexes that we think are underlying this. The first one to consider is the arterial baroreceptors. So a lot of the next... A uh, few slides I'm going to talk about is kind of, you know, med school, paramedic school, physiological knowledge that you'll be familiar with, but hopefully it will start to make a bit of sense. So stretch receptors in the aortic arch and the carotid sinus. And when you start to lose volume and your blood pressure, pressure starts to decline, you lose that stretch through those receptors. You get a decrease in your vagal tone and you get an uptick in your sympathetic activity. And as a consequence, you get that traditional tachycardia and vasoconstriction. OK, so this is what we think or we've been led to believe happens with all bleeding patients. But then the cardiac C fibers seem to get involved in a proportion of patients, probably patients who have predominantly incisional trauma, where they're located in the left ventricle myocardium and an underfilled patient who has a vigorously acting or working myocardium can stimulate these C fibers. And this is what drives that autonomic tipping point, that bradycardia and the peripheral vasodilation. And um, it might be that it's the heart's way of trying to preserve ventricular filling to try and improve the cardiac output, because at this moment in time, it's working hard and there's not enough venous returned back to the heart to actually fill to generate forward cardiac output. Now, the arterial chemoreceptors are also involved, and this might be why um, blunt polytrauma injury patients, so patients with tissue trauma, don't tend to get the vaso, um, this biphasic response. <clears throat> so these chemoreceptors, aortic bodies and carotid bodies, tend to respond to pH, CO2 changes, hypoxia, 
And it might be that the <clears throat> chest injury that you get with polytrauma patients, the ischemia, the acidosis, the pain associated with that is triggering these chemoreceptors. And that protects, we think, from this C-fiber mediated bradycardic response that we see in some patients who have hypervolemia from incisional trauma. So that's kind of the base reflexes behind that biphasic response. But we probably need to mention about bagel reflexes as well. Now, this is a term which I think gets used in differing for differing things. Some people, when they say vagal, they mean patients who are having a little bit of vagal response. Sometimes people say vagal because somebody might have a, a vagal nerve innervated reflex and sometimes people say vagal when they're referring to a biphasic heart rate response so you need to be cautious what you mean by it what i'm referring to is where patients who are not profoundly hypervolemic and are not having a biphasic heart rate response to exsanguination <clears throat> who do become bradycardic and do look really sick so this is a bleeding mimic is what i'm referring to by vagal reflexes here and the stimulus for this um, can be just the fact of having some trauma, um, being terrified that you're going to die and then starting to recover and being in a safe place. And I'll talk a little bit about prodromal events shortly. Um, blood on the peritoneum and in the pleural surfaces can cause irritation that vaguely drives bradycardia. And actually all these patients need is a bit of time. Their physiology will normalize and maybe a bit of analgesia and anxiolysis to help differentiate that patient group. And I'll talk a bit about a bit more about that later, because I think that's a useful tool to differentiate them from the biphasic heart rate responses. OK, so we've talked about the underlying physiology, so it's probably time to move on to <clears throat> the complexities with patients who have penetrating trauma. So it's a really interesting subject and they're, they're time critical for a few different reasons. But from my perspective, I think their physiology can be really misleading and they have a higher incidence of arterial pathology. OK, so just keep that in mind that when you when a blade goes into a patient, it will cut everything in the path. If you have blunt polytrauma, you get shear forces through your tissues and you tend to bleed from soft tissues, venous plexi, solid organs or bony injuries more commonly in blunt trauma than you would from an arterial pathology okay it's because of the nature of the way that you damage your vasculature now we tend to see that traditional shock physiology in blunt trauma we've talked spoken about why that is but in penetrating trauma it's different because of the biphasic response we see um, that we've discussed already because there's a higher incidence of arterial injury shock and there are more confounding factors that mask physiology, young patients who can compensate or prodromal episodes that might be toxicology related or the fact that they've been fighting or running from the, from the, for their lives, which is compl complicating their presenting physiology. So let's talk first of all about this arterial injury shock. So I've used this term a few times now and I probably need to clarify what I actually mean. So the first thing we need to think about is what the purpose of elastic arteries actually is. So they act as a pressure reservoir and they are entirely responsible for driving diastolic pressure and therefore diastolic flow. OK, they convert that intermittent flow from your heart into your elastic arteries into continuous arteriolar flow. I've got a video next, which I've shamelessly stolen off Twitter. Uh, which I think highlights the principle of why those elastic arteries are so important for continuous end organ blood supply and flow. Good. So I hope that video, which explains it in a much more coherent way than I ever could, demonstrates that concept of going from pulsatile to continuous flow. But the reason that's important is that if you have a defect in a large elastic artery, you instantaneously lose the ability to generate that diastolic blood pressure and therefore that continuous blood flow. 
Okay. And what will happen is you'll immediately lose the ability to perfuse the left side of your heart because that's, that's dependent on diastolic flow. Your left ventricular cardiac output will drop off very rapidly because you've now got ischemia myocardium and you'll reduce cerebral perfusion. And these are the patients who, if you get access to the CCTV footage of the assault itself, who may have been stabbed in the abdomen and they decline into unconsciousness and agonal rhythms within seconds. OK, you can't bleed to death that quickly. There has to be another underlying mechanism that's driving the decline of that patient's physiology. And it's probably related to large arterial pathologies. But of course, you'll exsanguinate concurrently. So they've got, they're going to ultimately have a mixed picture. But remember, if a, if a diagnosis is one of arterial injury shock, the treatment for that is immediate or early surgical control of the pathology. There's, there's no value in filling these patients with blood products without getting surgical control because you won't be able to reinstitute that diastolic pressure and that diastolic flow. You've got to seal the hole first and then recover any volume loss that they've had that's happened concurrently and I think that's really important because sometimes we think bleeding patients give them bloods we've got to think about mechanism trajectory of physiology and what the underlying cause of their bleeding is as well as treating the volume loss that might be present okay so that moves us on to the the concept of exsanguination so the process of actually losing so much blood and so much volume that you are bleeding to death and look, it's really hard to recognize because of all the physiological nonsense that I've just been talking about and how patients present in different ways. And we've got to think about different types of bleeding and different mechanisms of injury and baseline physiology. And some people have autonomic um, depressive responses and some people don't. And, you know, people you know, talk about the ATLS uh, shock table as being unreliable. I mean, Yes, you know, there are aspects of it that really are, and all the evidence base would suggest that it's not very good at predicting how much volume you're lost, but the concept of what it's trying to achieve, I think, is really worthwhile considering in that when you bleed, it will impact on different physiological systems. There's countless papers out there that show you can't use, you know, that, that baseline table to predict how much volume you've lost, but it is the underlying concept behind the hateful eight, okay, where you're using examination findings, you know, the physical signs of a patient to try and determine whether or not they have critical hypovolemia. Now, I should say that the hateful eight is probably a concept that everyone's very familiar with now. It's been used for quite a while, but it hasn't been a properly validated yet. There's plenty of work on going on to this at the moment. And if you work for services that have the opportunity to capture data around patients who are bleeding to death, then I would really advocate contributing towards that work so we can validate this as a tool. So there are a number of things that the hate fate refer to. So patients who are bleeding to death will be diaphoretic, they'll look pale. Now, they may have poor venous tone, and, and in my experience, that, that tends to be patients with blunt polytrauma. I think there's something about that incisional trauma where you maintain that vasodilatory tone that you tend to maintain your venous tone. I've certainly had patients who've been in traumatic hypervolemic cardiac arrest who had drain pipe veins. Okay, so I think it's more of a blunt trauma thing. Cerebration, I think, is really critical, really important to think about. That's really the point at which a patient decompensates. If they're cognizant, they can tell you who they are, what they're doing, and they are following commands and, and they're behaving with you, um, then they are compensating. Whether or not you need to transfuse them, it depends really on the mechanism of the injury, and I'll come to that later. But as soon as they start to get a bit confused, they're decompensated and we need to fill them. Okay, we need to do something about that. End tidal CT I'm going to talk about later. Um, I think it's really valuable. Uh, the trend, even non-invasive end tidal CO2s, the trend of those values can be used as a marker of whether or not someone's getting better or getting worse. Air hunger uh, seems to happen in a lot of patients. It might be because they're acidotic. It might be because they're trying to pull blood back into the thorax by generating negative intrathoracic pressures. And I've left heart rate and blood pressure at the end because they're unreliable. Your heart rate can be normal, slow or fast for the reasons we've discussed already. And most of the patients that we're assessing pre-hospitally we're measuring their blood pressure non-invasively and 
those machines cannot deal with hypervolemic patients. They will falsely reassure you with normal looking blood pressures, very high blood pressures, or cycling can't read blood pressures. Sometimes they'll tell you that their patient's hypotensive, but just be really cautious about using BP as your decision tool or your decision marker of this patient's hypervolemic. We should be using other physiological variables to identify that patient earlier. OK, so the next video is one that's in the public domain. It's one I've used a few times. You can find it on YouTube. And um, I have had permission from um, uh, Vicky, the patient in the video, to use this for educational purposes. And this is a this is a young lady who ha is exhibiting as aspects of the hateful eight um, following blunt polytrauma to her pelvis. So I just want you to have a look, think about these these signs and have a look and see what you can see present during this video. Uh, access on this side. She was lying in an abnormal position with her right leg twisted over the left leg. There was also what looked like tire marks across the, the pelvis. So it was pretty clear that the wheels had gone over her pelvis and legs. Right, so in terms of circulation, she's got no radial. So she's pretty shocked. She was really pale. She was gasping in an abnormal way. We couldn't measure a blood pressure. We could barely feel a central pulse. The whole picture looked as though she was bleeding to death from a major pelvic fracture. So I still, I think even with the hateful eight, we still need to think carefully about whether or not someone is, is bleeding to death because there are aggressive surgical and interventional procedures we can undertake pre-hospital um, in the right cohort of patients. So selecting this patient out early, I think is really important. And there are some other things we need to think about. So patients have to have a mechanism that's consistent with serious injury. So a central penetrating wound or high velocity mechanism of injury is required. And they have to have injuries on examination that are compatible with major bleeding. Just this week, I had um, a lady come through ED. It's a red trauma call involved in an RTC. Her primary survey was relatively unremarkable, but was hypotensive, tachycardic, um, had a, a fairly significant metabolic acidosis. But the primary survey didn't demonstrate any major injuries and her physical examination findings of exsanguination weren't present and had underlying metabolic reasons for the acidosis, a hemolytic le uh, leukemia and a baseline blood pressure of 70 anyway. And, you know, we were relying on this knowledge and this examination findings not to jump in with aggressively volume resuscitating that lady. And I think that just highlighted to me how important these concepts are. You need to have physiology evolving over appropriate time scale. You become, you can become, you know, life critically hypervolemic to a life threatening extent over two hours. That is really exsanguination. That is just severe hypervolemia from a moderate bleeding source. And those patients will respond to a moderate amount of, amount of volume resuscitations. So you need to think about time scale before we commit to more aggressive um, interventions and processes. Um, and I've already talked about the hate for late, but we need to think now about bleeding mimics. What are the conditions out there that are going to trick us into thinking someone is bleeding? There are loads of them, and I'm going to take them by turn um, and go through them. We'll talk about prodromal in a second. Vagal, we've already spoken about. Brain injury and tamponade, I think, is really important for us to delve into a bit more detail. Tension and tamponade, I'm going to touch on because I'm sure many of you will be familiar with those concepts already. OK, prodromal activity. What I mean by this is what happened to the patient before they were injured. OK, did they have a large catechlamin surge because they were running or fighting for their life? Or are there toxidromes complicating the picture? Because these patients who aren't bleeding to death, but are terrified and are now safe because they're with you in an ambulance on the way to hospital and you're calming them down, look dreadful. OK, and they need a bit of time for their physiology to normalise. And it can be pretty scary because you've got a pay young patient in front of you who looks like they're about to tip off their perch and you're not sure whether or not they are looking dreadful because they're decompensating or they're looking dreadful because they have got a bit of a prodromal um, decompensation from what's been happening. And I find that a bit of analgesia and anxiolysis just to help differentiate that patient group can be really valuable. On the one hand, 
they'll get better because their physiology will normalize. On the other hand, they won't, and you know sooner, so you can intervene sooner, and you can reverse that oxygen and debt sooner, okay? But you need to be ready to intervene, so make sure you've got some secured IV access to be able to do so. I won't labour this, we've spoken about it already, but some patients have vaguer responses to even the smallest of trauma. We've all seen that seven foot rugby builder who sees a little bit of blood, um, who suddenly feels really faint and looks dreadful. Okay, they just need a bit of time for their vagal reflex to normalize. Okay, I want to talk, I just want to mention tension pneumothorax because um, if you're spontaneously ventilating, this is not a bleeding mimic. Okay, I see this all the time where hypotension and cardiovascular collapse is attributed to somebody who's got spontaneously ventilating tension pneumothorax. It is a respiratory disorder that will cause them to become hypoxic. They will not be cardiovascularly collapsed unless they're arresting from hypoxia. So it's the last thing that happens. That mediastinal shift thing in a spontaneously ventilating tension will not impede venous return because at the same time as them getting mediastinal shift, they will be generating massive negative interthoracic pressures as they're working really hard to breathe and that will pull blood into their thorax. So they compensate their venous return. Okay, so spontaneously ventilating tensions become hypoxic, whereas mechanically ventilated tensions become core, um, cardiovascularly compromised. Okay, as soon as you ventilate somebody and they develop a tension pneumothorax, you will very quickly impede their venous return. Okay, so they're opposite conditions really. Think of the spontaneous ventilating as hypoxia and mechanically ventilated as hypotension as presenting symptoms. The reason it's important is that if your patient is cardiovascular collapsed and they've got tension in the thorax, they're probably also bleeding or have another bleeding mimic. So just be aware of that so you can treat it promptly. Okay, so this slide is old and actually it's now out of date. So there's new data that's about to be published by the London HEMS group. Um, and they presented that data at London Trauma Conference just two weeks ago. <clears throat> so I'm going to caveat this table um, with something at the end. Um, tamponade patients are obviously cardiovascularly compromised from obstructive shock. This is like survivors from years ago, London pre-hospital thoracotomies. And it's essentially telling the story that if you're going to survive, you want to have a single right ventricular wound, you want to rest in front of a critical care team, and you want almost an immediate pre thoracotomy. Now, the story is way more complex than that, and there's some really interesting stuff that's about to come out. This bit isn't true anymore. Um, I used to say uh, presenting rhythm maybe doesn't matter. Maybe the uh, the clot in the in the pericardium makes them asystolic because look how many asystolic patients survived. Actually, the much larger cohort of data suggests that that's not true. So watch this space. Uh, I'm not going to tread on anyone's toes because I've not been involved in collecting that data or publishing it, but there's new stuff coming on that topic. OK, let's talk about traumatic brain injury and why that causes cardiovascular collapse in patients who are not hypovolemic. The term hyperacute head injury is really just referring to the period of time between head injury and ambulance service arriving on scene. So that, that physiological um, responses that happen in patients who have a concussive force through their brain. And, and keep in mind, you don't have to have an organic brain pathology. You might have a normal CT head and still get this stuff. And it can cause two things. It can cause a ventilatory response, so dysventilation or apnea, otherwise known as impact brain apnea, or cardiac response. Often they happen concurrently. And it's that neurocardiac syndrome that I want to talk about next. You also get compromised cardiovascularly with brain injury. If you damage your brain stem, we get a high cord lesion. Um, but that's a given, really, and I'm not going to focus on that too much. So why do we get a neurocardiac syndrome? Why do you become cardiovascularly compromised when you have a concussive force through the brain? Well, it's probably to do with catechlamine surges. And that might be systemic catechlamine, so adrenaline that's released, and that causes um, widespread vasoconstriction. So you get massive swings in your left ventricular afterloads, but also directly uh, injures the myocytes by aggressively activating those beta uh, catechlamine receptors. And you also get local noradrenaline effects 
from sympathetic fibers directly on the heart, which also damage those myocytes as well. I'm going to show you in a couple of slides a GIF of uh, what an echocardiogram of a patient with a cardiomyopathy related to catecholamine surges looks like. And that's probably what's happening with our brain injured patients as well. I think CO2 is probably part of the key in differentiating these brain injured, cardiovascularly collapsing patients from those who are bleeding to death. In hypovolemia, you should be hypocapnic. OK, for two reasons, either you're acidotic and you're just tachypneic and you're blowing up your CO2 or you get what we what the anaesthetists who've done their FRCA refer to as West Zone 1 physiology. OK, and what that essentially is, is your right ventricle preload is reduced because you're bleeding and you're getting any venous return and therefore the right ventricular cardiac output decreases and you are unable to perfuse a big chunk of your alveoli. And so you get VQ mismatching. You're ventilating the alveoli, but there's no blood supply to them. So you can't offload your CO2 and you can't breathe it out. So your end tidal CO2 decreases in hypovolemia. It should always be low. In brain injury, it's slightly different. You, you either are normocapnic, so the amount of CO2 you're breathing out is normal because you've got ventr left ventricular failure back pressure across the lung capillaries, they splint open and you get good VQ matching. So you have the ability to offload that CO2 from the blood into your alveoli. Or you've got centrally mediated hypoventilation. You've got a brainstem injury, you're not breathing very well, your GCS is really low and your CO2 starts to climb. Now what I've done here is I've massively overcomplicated a really simple concept. That is, if you're diagnosis is hypovolemia as a cause for someone's cardiovascular collapse, they should be hypocapnic if you've got an eye gel down or you've got them intubated. If they're not, you should rethink your diagnosis. Okay. Right, which brings us nicely on to this idea of cardiogenic shock and trauma. I used to think cardiogenic shock and trauma was steering wheel injury to the heart, bruised myocardium, failing heart. I mean, yeah, that is one of the causes, but there are loads of them. We've talked about this hyperacute head injury, this neurocardiac response that we get as a combination of the hypoxia that we have from dysventilation, but also this cataclaming surge that causes an injury to the heart. And it probably was, was, um, results in something called a reverse Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Now, Takotsubo just means octopus part in Japanese, and you can see from this GIF how that terminology might have come about from seeing echoes of patients who've got a stunned apex but a contracting base of the heart. In brain injury we think it's the other way around where the base of the heart is stunned and the apex is contracting but that's a bit of an academic point it doesn't really matter the point is that in brain injury you can get a failing heart that can be classified as a cardiomyopathy. You also get pump failure from bruising to the heart as I said before blood trauma to the chest that blunt trauma can cause valvular disruptions, coronary dissections. If you're cold and you're acidotic, your heart won't beat very well. You can get catecholamines that are released systemically for lots of different reasons, not just brain injury that can damage the heart. As I said before, you can injure your brainstem and your high cord. And actually cytokine storms from massive multi-system trauma also causes myocyte damage and ultimately will lead to SIRS like sponsors, capillary leak and distributive shock as well. So actually this cardiogenic shock picture in trauma is probably more common than we give it credit for credit to. And there's certainly work on going at the moment looking in hypovolemic patients, so code red patients pre-hospital, whether or not we can give any novel pharmacological agents such as regadenosone to protect the myocardium from injury and prevent that delayed heart failure and multi-organ dysfunction <clears throat> that we see in super sick major trauma patients. And we'll have to wait and see what that research shows. Okay, this is the last uh, two slides, resuscitation targets. I get asked a lot, you know, what should we resuscitate patients to? Should we do permissive hypertension for everybody? What, what's going on? So look, 
I've taken this directly from a London uh, resuscitation essay, the London Hems SAP. Um, uh, and it's probably out of date because I took it a few years ago. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it's really hard to have a, a single rule that fits every single patient. OK, and the absolute numbers on this slide don't really matter. OK, the one I've highlighted in bold, I think, is important. All of the evidence base around permissive hypertension in the civilian world, if you delve into the papers and look at the patients included, they're predominantly incisional trauma, young patients, or have no, no or very few comorbidities, and are male. Okay. Now, if you think about most of the trauma that we have in the UK, they're usually middle-aged, blunt polytrauma with comorbidities. But yet we extrapolate that, that weak evidence base for permissive hypotension um, where we hold back volume resuscitation into all-cause resuscitation or all-cause trauma. And there was a great editorial in Anesthesia last year um, by Matthew Wiles. I think it was called Pop the Clot or Drain the Brain, which I really recommend reading. I'm going to read this, this quote from the paper because it really caught my attention. I think it summarised it really nicely. So hypotension in trauma should be recognised as the decompensation of a bleeding trauma patient. Often, but not always, requiring immediate blood product resuscitation to maintain adequate cerebral and end organ perfusion. So if your patient is hypotensive, they're probably about to die. Maybe. And what we probably need to do is consider a number of different factors for us to provide modern, cutting edge, individualized trauma care when we think about what our resuscitation targets should be. And I would suggest, and I going off this editorial, which I think was really nicely written, that there are three things to consider. When you think about the patient themselves, how old is our patient? What comorbidities do they or might they have? What drugs might they be on? Because a 20 year old with no comorbidities will tolerate hypotension and low flow and increasing oxygen debt way longer than a comorbid patient in their 70s. When you think about injury factors, because if they've got incisional trauma and a, and a potential arterial pathology, well, actually, yeah, there is some evidence space to suggest permissive hypertension in the right context could be valuable for that patient. But if it's a blunt polytrauma patient with bony and solid organ injury, well, actually, their blood pressure, their systolic blood pressure is, bears no um, influence on whether or not you're going to make that bleeding worse. So we should probably resuscitate these patients earlier. And how long has it been since time of injury? I mean, certainly in the region I work in, it's very rare for us to get a patient to hospital from 999 call under an hour. So I would suggest that the largest cohort of patients that we see who are cardiovascularly compromised from hypovolemia in the UK probably need to be resuscitated to uvolemia in the pre-hospital field. Probably. So what can we agree upon? Well, the remaining components of damage control resuscitation should be aggressively pursued. And what I mean by that is normalization of coagulopathy, avoidance of hypothermia, hypocalcemia and hyperkalemia, and rapid surgical or interventional radiologically achieved hemorrhage control. And that might be in the pre-hospital field and the right cohort patient with the right team or rapid conveyance to hospital for surgical intervention in a major trauma centre. That's me. Thank you. So these are references which will be available later and I'm going to stop sharing the screen, hand back and open for some questions. Thank you for listening. That was perfectly timed Dr Jake. I literally have just um, popped in the chat your feedback form for people to give some genuine feedback for you tonight. So uh, in the chat option, uh, you should probably see at the very bottom there. Uh, I did pop it in, didn't I? Oh, I'm completely making it up. Maybe I didn't pop it in. You caught me off guard there, Dr. J. Let me try copy and pasting that again. So um, I'm going to give people a minute or so to pop some questions in the Q&A box. And uh, there is your link to give uh, the feedback for tonight's webinar. Oh, it is there. Oh, there you go. I've put it in twice. Uh, thanks so much, Daryl. Maybe I'm just too efficient for my own good sometimes. Uh, you can probably see a um, rake. The team have just brought in a rake of cups. So I have got literally 
12 cups to give away. So please do leave us some feedback on social media or I'll put some post uh, links in the chat in a second. But more importantly, please do click in that survey and give some feedback for tonight's presenter because that helps Dr. Jake for his own CPD as well as your own CPD, which makes it all very CPD-ish, doesn't it? Fabulous. Right, so let me share my screen. I'm going to give you one minute to um, finish uh, your questions and answers uh, while Dr. Jake goes through and then we will uh, read the Q&A out. It's as simple as that. And uh, we are well on time. In fact, 10, look at that. 20.45, perfectly timed. So you've got your link for your feedback. Uh, if you want to join us tonight, you can join us via going to cpdme.com or you can download the app from the App Store or from Google Play. Dead simple. I promise you, it will be the best 17 quid you spend. You get 100 live webinars plus access to over 300 recordings and, of course, that magical CPD that just magically happens. Um, somebody asked a question, can Irish members upgrade to premium? Uh, the bank won't accept uh, Revolt or Irish account. Uh, yes, it can. Just drop the team a ticket at team at cpdme.com or WhatsApp us from in the app and they'll send you, I think we've got a special direct debit for um, the fabulous people who live over in Ireland. Uh, and speaking of which, I think we're coming to about five shows in Ireland shortly, so keep a, an eye on our events page. Uh, and of course, please take a look at our YouTube channel where we feature all of the exciting content and some of the webinar broadcasts like tonight. So if you ever miss out or you're late attending, you can always go back on, it's all like, almost like a demand you can go back onto YouTube and you can watch it from the start and then maybe jump onto the Q&A. So please do jump over to YouTube and subscribe and do whatever you need to do. You need to click the little bell or something like that, don't you? Do something. I, I'm, I would never be a very good YouTube blogger, but that's what you need to do. And of course, if you are looking for more CPD, please do jump over onto our website. Or if you download the app, as you can see there at the top highlighted in green, to register for Jake's webinar, it would have been one click of the app. And what that stops happening is you mismatching your email, which means you then don't get a certificate because you've used a different email to register onto Zoom. And I've seen somewhere in the chat tonight that that happens quite a lot. But if you download the app and you register it to your real name and real last name and real email address, it will match it all up perfectly. Uh, otherwise, the admin team uh, have to have two cups of coffee in the morning when they try to match up. Uh, so we have like 25 David Browns uh, to try and find out which one's really you. Also, really good in the chat if you tell us uh, where you found out about Jake's webinar tonight. So please just pop into the chat quickly uh, where you found out, whether it was social media, whether it was the app, whether it was website. Uh, again, because the, the marketing team get quite excited uh, when you do things like that. So um, let's have a look at the questions and answers, Jake. Uh, oh gosh, there's loads of people chatting in the chat now. Fabulous. Um, so, Billy has asked, how would you utilise non-invasive entitled CO2 monitoring in a trauma patient and does it provide reasonable accuracy or is it best used for trend tracking? Yeah, so that's a great question and it's, it's a really valuable tool. I think I'm going to answer this in two parts. Um, let's talk about the blunt polytrauma patient first. So, um, if you've got a patient who you've already intubated, say low GCS, a bit cardiovascularly compromised, um, you've rsi them in a safe fashion um, and their end tidal CO2 remains low and your non-invasive blood pressure is unreadable, you can be pretty confident that they're going to need some volume resuscitation. Okay? If it was purely a brain injury related hypotensive episode, you'd expect that end tidal CO2 to be normal or high. Okay? So you can use it to kind of guide therapy a little bit. And of course, you'll examine your patient and you'll know that they'll have other features of hypovolemia. <laughs> Now, non-invasive blood pressure is really unreliable in pre-hospital field. So you, I have used in the past the trend of NTI to CO2 to, to assess whether or not my volume resuscitation is improving the right ventricular cardiac output. Okay. The only caveat to that is you just need to set your minute ventilation to a set value. Because as soon as you start fiddling with your respiratory rate, then you're just going to start to influence that. The second answer to that question is those stabbing patients who you've had to sedate you now do not have the ability to assess cerebration as whether or not they're decompensating. They might have been aggressive and needed sedating for other reasons. And I find non-invasive nasal end CO2 a really great way of seeing whether or not they're responding to treatment or if they're nice and static and it's not declining away, then I can, and they've got palpable pulses, then I'm close to hospital, then maybe they don't need blood product resuscitation. So you can use both non-invasive trends and invasive trends to your advantage there. Okay, and we've got a next question for you. Would you adjust your treatment depending on the age of your patient? So does patient age reflect on how they respond? 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I think I partially answered this with, with one of my sl last slides. You've got to think about patient factors when you're deciding what your resuscitation thresholds are going to be for patients. Think about the injuries that they have, what you think is bleeding, how old they are, what comorbidities they might have, and use that to guide your resuscitation strategy. And, and my rule of thumb, if it's blunt polytrauma and you know they're relatively old and they might have comorbidities, I get them euvolemic as soon as I can. Um, I just fill them back up. I need to make sure that I'm minimizing their oxygen depth because they will tolerate it really poorly and their mortality risk will really increase very rapidly down the line if we don't correct that pathology. And it's unlikely in blunt trauma that they're going to have an isolated arterial pathology that's going to be made worse by normalizing their blood pressure. Excellent. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Helena, I can quickly answer that question for you. Uh, if you drop the support team an email tomorrow, they will um, make give you access to everything you would missed for the last two years, but you will have access anyway via the dashboard to all the recordings, so you can request certificates yourself. Um, they have got a question. This is an excellent presentation. Would it be possible to see the screen with the literature sources once more? Uh, I will screen grab it after this presentation's broadcast, and I'll pop it onto our Twitter channel. So if you jump over to Twitter at CPDME, I promise around nine o'clock it will be there on you. And I'm really sorry, I'm not going to try and pronounce your... In fact, let me try and pronounce your first name. Thush. I've got that so wrong. I'm so sorry. Um, and I'll apologise again on Twitter when I post it, but I'll put the literature on there for you. Um, I can hear people sort of like, oh, gosh, Andrew, you've made a right mess in that first name. Anyway, Andy, I've got your name right. Andy has asked, any different considerations for sp spontaneous obstetric bleeding? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it, the same considerations for uh, obstetric trauma bleeding, I guess. Um, if there's any decompensation, you know, decerebration and not fusing their brain very well, or they genuinely have cardiovascular collapse, you need to aggressively resuscitate that patient. Uh, as we all know, an obstetric patient has a relatively increased circulation volume. They will compensate for hypovolemia way longer than a non-pregnant cohort will. But during that compensation phase, they are shunting um, perfusion away from the placental interface, uh, utero-placental interface, so they're compromising fetal um, perfusion and survival. So you just need to resuscitate these patients faster and earlier. There's also probably something in there about um, correcting fibrinogen levels earlier. Um, we're waiting on cryostat trial results, looking at early cryoprecipitate administration. But if you have access to cryo, there's some evidence to suggest that we should front load um, your hemostatic resuscitation strategy in obstetric trauma hemorrhage to, to keep that fibrinogen level up because it runs higher in obstetrics. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Adam's quickly asked, uh, out of all the CPD agencies, have we worked with NREMT in the States? Uh, we haven't worked directly with them, Adam, but I have had some conversations in the past because I'm very fortunate to come out to EMS World every year. But um, if you have any links, just drop them to us at team at cpdme.com and we're more than happy. We normally have quite a big following in the States, so it'd be good to uh, reinforce that. Uh, another question, what kind of analgesia is best for managing that patient that were unsure about decompensating? Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, so I think the easy answer is use what you're comfortable with and you use regularly because you, you're walking a fine line with a patient who looks sick and you're trying to figure out if they're having a bit of an autonomic wobble or whether or not they're actually hypovolemic. And you need to be very careful and judicious with your dosing. My preference, I use um, either a little bit of ketamine or a little bit of fentanyl. It's titratable. I use lots of it in my practice, but I appreciate that that's, those aren't drugs that are necessarily available to everybody. So if, you know, if morphine is what you have um, and you use a lot of it, be very careful with it, but you can use it to the same, to the same role if you need to. Excellent. And we have got one final question for you, which is, would you limit your amount of normal saline if blood is not available? Yeah, so good. that's an interesting one. So, um, OK, so I'm not going to delve into the refill trial, but, you know, one of the take homes for me for that trial was that um, perhaps saline pre-hospital isn't isn't as bad as we thought it was or I thought it was. That's my interpretation of of that evidence there. I'm not speaking on behalf of the authors at all. And, um, you know, we have to 
we have to restore organ perfusion. And, and the name of the game is reversing oxygen debt in patients who are, who are hypovolemic and decompensating. And actually, you're not going to you're not going to decrease your oxygen delivering capacity with dilution of your red cells um, until you reach a hemoglobin concentration about 70 or 80. So if you don't have access to blood products and your patient has clinical signs of severe hypovolemia and they've got an accumulating oxygen debt as a consequence, then yes, I would give them saline to try and reverse that process, but prioritize getting them to surgical control as soon as possible and where you have access to blood product resuscitation would be my answer. Would I limit the volume? Um, uh, no, I'm not going to put a limit on it. You just need to give what you need to give to get the patient back to the point where they're perfusing their, perfusing their key organs effectively. Excellent, Dr. Jake. Thank you so much indeed. Well, what a fascinating webinar. Literally, you couldn't even, have, if, you've, if you'd have bundled that up in Christmas joy with Ferrero Rocher's and Twiglets, you couldn't have got that all within an hour, but we've managed to do it amazingly. So, Dr. Jake, thank you so much indeed for your time tonight, and we really appreciate your um, presentation. You're welcome. Thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you indeed. So remember, folks, please do leave us some genuine feedback. It is so important for both the team here at CPDME and the speaker and also to move things forward and make sure that we can afford to bring you some of these amazing webinars, which are free of charge. And also thank you to all those members who have joined us tonight. Genuinely, I have just seen a list of around 20 new people tonight who's just come on board. So that makes us able to bring these amazing webinars to you. And of course, all the team here behind me, make sure that they give you some excellent support, certainly when it comes to building your portfolio for your governing bodies and such. So on behalf of myself and all of the team here at CPME, thank you so much indeed. Uh, I will stay online for the chat. So if you have any questions for the next five minutes, please do send them through on the chat or through the Q&A and I will answer them. But in the interim, thank you all much for your support. Thank you for taking part in this webinar with us tonight. Please make sure you jump over to the website. I'll find that again for you. It's on my screen because we have got literally listed i think another 30 40 webinars coming up in the next few months and more to come shortly once caroline and the team reveal the rest of their findings so on behalf of myself and the team kick off your slippers enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you so much for your continuing support take care everybody and thank you so much <laughs>